the reason I ask that is today's discussion is targeted for equatorial telescopes, okay? There's no need to align a Dobsonian telescope. So if you've got a Dobsonian, you can leave now or sit around, take some notes, and maybe down the track, if you're looking to get a, an equatorial, then this will be useful. Now, um, you're probably aware that there's generally two types of equatorials. You've got German equatorials such as this one, where its polar axis has, has to be aligned on the pole for good quality visual observing or, or photography. Um, and it's got the declination axis at right angles to it. Or you've got um, a, um, a Mead or Celestron fork type mount. Okay? In the case of the Mead and Celestron fork type mounts, you also need the polar axis, which is at the base of the U shape of your arms. That needs to be aligned with the pole as well. Um, they're quite popular, have been in the past, but more popular these days seems to be the German Equatorial. Okay. Same basic principles apply. Now, before we get on to that, um, just to recap, we've talked about this before in previous workshops. I'm not sure that everybody's heard it before. But in order to do visual work where your subject stays still in your eyepiece, or to do photographic work, you need the polar axis of your telescope pointing to the south celestial pole. Okay? If it's not pointing to the south celestial pole, there's two things that are going to, three things actually that are going to happen. First of all, you won't be able to use the go-to facility of your telescope to point accurately to an object. That's the first problem. Okay? Secondly, if you are going to do photography and you want to guide and you're not sitting on the pole, the telescope won't track the subject very well and any software or any corrections that you need to make on an auto guiding <coughs> to an auto guider will uh, be working very hard and eventually the auto guider may well be flat out keeping up with the errors in the system and can't track anymore for you. Okay? Now the third issue is that um, if the axis of the telescope, polar axis of the telescope is not on the pole there's a, an effect called frame rotation and basically what that means is even if you could keep your telescope centered on an object in your field of view of your camera, objects around at the edges of the frame will rotate. Okay, so you get rotation taking place. And that just ruins the edges of the field of view. It's <clears throat> not very nice if you've got a telescope with good quality optics which gives you nice pinpoint stars to the edges of your field of view and then it's ruined by rotation because your polar axis isn't accurately aligned. So there's three good reasons to actually have your polar axis aligned. Okay? Um, let's just concentrate on visual for the moment. <clears throat> we'll come to photographic uses later. Now is everybody aware that the Earth has two south poles? You've got the true South Pole, and that's the point around which the Earth turns. Okay? That's the South Pole we're looking for. But an easy way to set the telescope up to uh, a South Pole, for vis which is good enough for visual work, would be to set it up on a magnetic pole. Now, you're all aware also that the Earth's magnetic poles don't lie on the true North and South Poles. They lie offset. Now, in the case of the South Pole, which is the one we're interested here, the south pole, south magnetic pole, uh, lies more or less in a direction of Adelaide from Brisbane. It's about 11 degrees uh, west of true south. So that if you set this telescope up here by taking a compass and pointing that pole according to the magnetic uh, indication of south, you won't be on the true south pole. Okay. So you have to rotate your telescope a little bit further, about 11 degrees, 11 and a half degrees from memory, to compensate for that difference between magnetic south and true south. Okay? The other thing you need to do <coughs> is to ensure that your um, altitude scale or elevation scale On the 
the side of the telescope is pointing to the latitude that you're at now. So if you were in uh, Brisbane, 27 and a half degrees. If you go to Leeburn, it's another half degree south, so you need 28 degrees here. Okay, that's pretty easy to remember. And you'll find that in many telescopes these days, there's a little bubble level to help you get that uh, base of the equatorial head level too. Now the important thing when it comes to the elevation is to ensure that you have that axis there at the latitude of your location. Some people fuss around trying to get the head level and then get this on 27 and a half degrees and that's fine. Other people won't even worry about the, the base being level but they will go to the trouble of getting that axis through there still at 27 and a half degrees. Okay? There has been a myth in the past that you needed the equatorial head level in order for all this to work. You don't. The key thing is to have that axis at your latitude. So if you've got this tilted at 5 degrees, it doesn't matter. As long as that axis there is at 27 and a half degrees to the ground, you will be on the pole once you've got this pointing to the south celestial pole. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay, so for visual work, a compass or even a knowledge of the South Celestial Pole and the sky is all you need. Um, you can uh, set your telescope up if you wish very quickly, if you're not going to do photography, set the telescope up so that your axes are square, something roughly like this will do. Just make sure the telescope's sitting vertical in that direction and the declination axis is sitting parallel to the polar axis. At this point you can either line up a compass with that axis there pointing to the magnetic pole and then rotate the telescope about 11 degrees roughly and you'll be good enough for visual work. Won't help you terribly much for accurate pointing if you have a go-to telescope. So if you have a go-to telescope, you'll have to line that even closer, okay? But if you just want a quick five-minute setup time, that's all you're going to need. And if you're looking at the brighter planets or the moon, it's no problem. If your go-tos are out, you can still point to that particular subject once the telescope gets there. Now, if you're going to do um, Photography, there are a couple of different ways of doing it and depending on the sort of mount and the um, accessories that come with that mount, it may be easy, it may be difficult, okay? Now, I'll describe the, the simplest way and the simplest way is if you bought a telescope which has a polar finder in the back of it. You should be able to see here. We've got looks like an eyepiece of a telescope sticking out the back and that's exactly what we have. Built into this axis on this particular telescope there's a little telescope inside that axis. That's its dust cover which has come off the front and inside that telescope there's a little uh, plastic reticle and it's got some black marks indicating the north celestial pole and the south celestial pole in there. The whole idea is that you look through that polar finder uh, eyepiece at the end and you actually physically move the telescope axis so that if you're in the northern hemisphere, the stars indicated on that little reticle inside here line up with the stars in the sky. Likewise, if you're in the southern uh, hemisphere, you'll move the telescope so that the stars around the south celestial pole will line up through that telescope there. So Sounds easier said than done. Do yes, exactly. The whole idea is, and you can do this without the telescope on if it's easier, okay? You can even remove the telescope, just look through the pole of finder scope and line up the uh, indicated marks inside the polar scope with the stars in the sky. Now, unfortunately for the southern hemisphere desert denizens, right, we don't have a nice bright star to indicate to us 
anywhere near the South Celestial Pole. If you're in the Northern Hemisphere, you do. Polaris isn't on the true North Celestial Pole, but it's near enough to be a very good guide marker, okay? South Celestial Pole, we don't have that. We've got a bunch of faint little stars, barely visible through that polar finder scope, okay? And before you even think about pulling the dust cover off the front and the cap off the rear, you need to set your telescope up roughly to the south. You need two things then. You need a map of the South Celestial Pole showing those faint stars and you need a pair of binoculars. And believe me, I've done this many times. And it seems to me every month or two that I go up to Leeburn and I've got to align this, I need to consult my map and my binoculars and look very hard for the South Celestial Pole because it's not the sort of thing that after just a couple of months you go, there it is. It's something you need to see once, twice, three times, at least I have to anyway. So you need a map of that area and you need binoculars. Now once that happens, maps of the South Celestial Pole generally show the fainter stars close in. And one of the closest and brightest is called Sigma Octans. So it's easy enough to get a map of Sigma Octans and the surrounding area. But it's generally speaking a very um, uh, zoomed in view of the South Celestial Pole and you can't see that with the naked eye. You need your binoculars. The issue is that you don't even know where to point that zoomed in map without a bigger map. And the bigger map will, is the sort of map you need that will show you where uh, the Southern Cross is, a couple of other stars around the pole, and they will be pointers to other stars down near the South Celestial Pole. And for those of you who were here back earlier in workshops, I would have talked about navigation and recognising star patterns using triangles. The best way to come from the Southern Cross and other stars is to look for patterns in the sky, particularly triangles. And so I can't describe to you today how to get to the South Celestial Pole star by star. What I can say is when you stand under a dark sky and you can see the, South Celest sorry, the, the Southern Cross, a couple of other stars, and you've got your map, look at your map, pick out a couple of triangles in the sky that line up with the triangles on the map, navigate there. And then use that as a, as a starting point to zoom in close on the South Celestial Pole. And, and you will find that with a bit of practice, with your close-in map of the South Celestial Pole and binoculars, you can get to it after a couple of minutes. But it's not easy, okay? So don't expect to walk away from here under a dark sky if ever we get one again. And, and think you're going to find the South Celestial Pole in two minutes. If you do, you're lucky, okay? Most people don't. So you've got to be prepared for this. Now, once you find uh, the South Celestial Pole direction in the sky, it's always a good idea to um, try to memorize where it's sitting in the sky by picking a point, either edge of a roof or a tree or a couple of features from where you're standing because as soon as you take your eyes off that area, you look back up and you'll go, now where was it? Okay? So when you do think you find it with the binoculars, take your binoculars away, have a look. Tree there, hill there. Okay, so it's about there. Because what you've got to do then is align the telescope hopefully with it set to the latitude of your location and you think right tree there hill there it's in about that direction there and all you're doing is roughly aligning that polar axis now with the south celestial pole the next thing you're going to do <laughs> is the hard work everything until now has been easy now's the hard work there's uh, two fine adjustments on the equatorial head on this particular model okay You've probably all realised that this one here, this axis here, has a fine adjustment at the back. By adjusting that, you can adjust that equatorial head up and down 27 and a half degrees, band a little bit, up a little bit. This one here has two adjustment screws to allow it to rotate. Okay? Leave those fixed for the time being. You have to get down on your knees at this point particularly if you've got a small tripod. You've got to look through the polar finder scope 
And there's a very important trick which makes life easier for you here. And that is, when you're looking through, learn to use both eyes. One eye to look through the finder scope of the polar axis, and the other eye to look at the, other eye to look at the sky in that position that you identify the south celestial pole in. Because by doing that, what you'll do is move the mount until you can see those stars around the south celestial pole. Okay? Is this making sense? So this is a very iterative process, starting big, zooming in over time. Once you've got that Roughly, you can see the stars through the polar finder scope. That's when you undo the fine adjustment knobs down here. And you've freed up that access now, like this. And what you need to do is to turn one or the other to slowly fine tune the position of this axis one way or the other. And with a little bit of practice, you'll work out which one. Okay? Now, once you bring the stars in, onto the uh, stars in this reticle here, that's when we can lock everything up. Now there's one other thing you may have to do, and that is depending on the time of night, the stars inside this reticle, the star indicators inside this reticle, will be, have to be rotated to match up with the rotation of the stars in the sky. Okay? Now once you've got that polar axis pointing at the south celestial pole stars, you're about as close as you'll need to be, for the most part, for uh, visual observing where the stars won't move in the eyepiece. And go-tos will be reasonably accurate with a large eyepiece or low-power low eyepiece. 